Hello, my name is Vitas, and today I will be giving uh, the second lecture on the alchemical free energy calculations, and I will concentrate on the applications of these calculations on uh, proteins, nucleic acids, and ligands. Uh, so we will be dealing with mutating uh, with mutating amino acids in proteins, uh, nucleotides in DNA, and uh, uh, we will apply arbitrary. Uh, we will apply arbitrary modifications to organic molecules, so drug-like compounds, for example. And for all of these uh, applications, we will be I, w I will be referring to the uh, package which uh, uh, we termed PMX. It's an in-house developed package in our group, uh, and uh, uh, it allows performing all of these alchemical modifications for you. So let's let's start our uh, our presentation with the. Uh, the amino acid mutations. We will deal with the 20 canonical amino acids here, and uh, we will uh, deal with uh, al alchemical with the alchemical perturbations to complete thermodynamic cycles like this one that I'm showing here. This cycle uh, shows how to calculate the free energy of protein folding. So, but not the absolute, but the relative free energy of protein folding upon an amino acid mutation. So um, how much this folding free energy would be different if the blue amino acid, for example, here, tryptophan, would be replaced with the phenylalanine, in this case, with the red amino acid in this cycle. So we could uh, naively think we could calculate this by going in the vertical line, so performing the actual folding simulation, so one folding simulation uh, and another one for the mutant, and uh, taking the difference of these two free energy, uh, uh, potentially well-converged free energy estimates, but we can do it alchemically by going in the horizontal directions and uh, obtaining the same, exactly the same delta delta G. Of course, such a simulation is not uh, a standard one anymore if we need to actually mutate an amino acid on the fly, right? It requires a special treatment of our uh, structures and topologies that we provide to the molecular dynamics simulation engine. We are using Gromax uh, in, in this case. And uh, how, how to tell Gromax that we need a modified, uh, an alchemically modified amino acid? Well, that's exactly what PMX allows us to do. So how it works under the hood? It actually uh, creates a hybrid amino acid. Here I'm using an example, valine to phenylalanine. Let's say we want to mutate valine to phenylalanine. Uh, uh, we need to represent this amino acid uh, uh, it's, it's both states and it's and also it's hybrid state right so in state a uh, it has to be valine in state b it has to be phenylalanine and in between it has to be uh, some uh, linear interpolation between the two of them so this all is achieved by uh, having uh, pmx uh, make its magic under the hood and uh, provide you with a stru hybrid structure and topology which you can plug in into the simulation engine so uh, how PMX works, just very briefly, it is a set of Python uh, it's, uh, scripts it's, uh, and, and uh, modules, which uh, takes a structure and firstly it mutates, mutate.py, for example, it mutates the uh, amino acid and creates a hybrid structure. Then pdb to gmx that's a, a Chromox tool, which uh, creates a topology. And then we add the B state, so we just adjust the topology to get a hybrid, hybrid topology, all of this. Workflow seems quite complex, but it also can be achieved via PMX web server. So you can see that exactly the same workflow then is uh, just uh, hidden in the uh, in, in just in a few clicks, uh, uh, mouse clicks, uh, in this web server. Uh, and one more thing, just before going into the applications, I would like to tell uh, a little bit about the non-equilibrium free energy calculation protocol, which we'll be using in all of these applications that I will show uh, later. So it is a, a, a powerful approach, uh, not um, uh, not uh, so frequently used as the equilibrium approach. However, it has its own advantages, uh, and uh, uh, how how it uh, proceeds, it's um, uh, slightly different from the classical stratification uh, approach, uh, uh, which uh, a FEP approach, for example, uses. Uh, in this case, we are simulating. Uh, one state of the protein, so wild type state in equilibrium state A. We also do the same. Uh, simulate. Uh, we simulate in equilibrium. Just run a, a molecular dynamic simulation in state B. We acquire the two equilibrium trajectories. 
extract the snapshots from them and start very rapid non-equilibrium transitions. Those transitions are uh, on, on the order of hundreds of picoseconds. So very quickly we make uh, we introduce a mutation, so from wild type to mutant and also going backwards from mutant to wild type. In, uh, during each of these transitions we record the work required uh, to, to perform this transition and uh, plot them in a histogram way, as, as it's visualized there in the small histograms in the, on the slide. Uh, once we do this, we can uh, also uh, use Crookes fluctuation theorem and uh, uh, extract uh, the free energy difference between those two states. Right, so we now have all the technical background that is needed to go into the applications, and let's have a look at the ter protein thermostability. So we wanted to know what is the free energy difference uh, upon uh, amino acid mutation uh, in protein folding. Uh, we looked at the Barnes, and it's a very good uh, test system because it has been studied experimentally very, very uh, thoroughly. Uh, here we collected 119 mutations at 55 positions. You see that uh, almost <coughs> whole protein here is covered, uh, so uh, we can mutate every almost every residue uh, in it. And we can compare uh, against the experimental uh, uh, experimental measurements, and this gives us a very interesting thermodynamic comparison of the force fields. We can check which force fields perform better and which worse in terms of agreement to the experiment. Right here, I'm showing averaged unsigned error. AUE, AUE is averaged unsigned error from uh, the experiment when averaging all the results for all of these 119 mutations, and we can see that all the force fields perform quite well. Uh, the um, the difference is um, between between the force fields is about uh, one to two kilojoules per mole, uh, and the newer force fields, they are Charm 36 and Amber, with the modifications, they perform uh, significantly better than, let's say, an older force field. In this case, we used an older version of the OPLS force field. So we can start uh, really uh, looking at the thermodynamic comparison of the force fields, and we can also look in, into uh, an interesting avenue how to combine the results in the best way. So here I will not go into much detail, but we can start building now consensus results of the force fields. Either we can use some machine learning uh, technique, like partial least squares uh, technique, to build mm, one single best answer, uh, let's say by combining the results from the two force fields, or from five of them. And actually we notice that even combining the results from only two force fields, so our best amber version and charm version, it uh, once combined, we would get a better answer than uh, a better agreement with experiment than uh, when using any of the single force fields. A uh, similar uh, result comes out also for a different protein. We also probed uh, it's not only working with that uh, barnase, but also here staphylococcal nuclease. It also gives a very uh, accurate uh, free energy differences below one kilocalorie per mole. This is uh, like a golden. Uh, limit which uh, usually people uh, strive to reach uh, in, in, in accuracy of these calculations so we are well mm, below that limit and mm, also again the consensus approach works better than, than a single force field taken separately. Uh, we also can uh, use uh, these amino acid mutations to probe not only mm, uh, uh, protein thermostability but for example also uh, uh, look at the drug resistance. So, uh, uh, in in a number of applications, we have looked now uh, at how much the drug uh, resistance would be drug resistance would be induced by a protein mutation. Uh, here is an example of this uh, HIV protease. So, protease itself is a is a protein which is necessary for uh, HIV maturation, and uh, it is one of the main targets for all of the anti-HIV drugs. Uh, the the virus, however, once uh, it evolves, it becomes resistant um, uh, to to the anti-HIV drugs by means of mutations. Here are several mutations that I'm showing in blue. Uh, so they are uh, known uh, from uh, from uh, sequencing of the of uh, the genomes of viruses. Uh, that ha uh, of, of the patients who have been treated with anti-HIV drugs, that those mutations, that those positions are uh, usually mutated, and then again the virus escapes the drugs, uh, uh, the, the effects of the drugs. Uh, so how could we?
probe uh, for the effect of a mutation on a drug by means of the free energy, uh, free, free energy calculations. So here we would construct a slightly different thermodynamic cycle where we would have uh, mm, a mutation in the uh, HAV in its upper form uh, with respect to a mutation in the HAV in its hollow form where the drug is bound. But uh, all the other machinery uh, can be co uh, is, is uh, identical to the one that I described previously. All the simulation technique and uh, the non-equilibrium free energy calculations. Now, um, what we looked at uh, was uh, many of those mutations. So here I marked uh, here I marked uh, a few of them, uh, and uh, we looked at uh, a number of uh, known. Uh, HIV protease inhibitors. They are actual drugs that are on the market. And we were able to recover a very uh, good agreement with the experiment just by uh, uh, just by performing the exactly the same calculations that I outlined before. Uh, and uh, we are able to recover uh, a very good uh, correlation, as you can see, uh, for six ligands, so six uh, known HIV drugs, although there is a uh, slight offset, but in this case we did not uh, employ our uh, consensus force field. We uh, know that that would uh, uh, likely improve the results a little bit, but we are already quite happy with such, an, uh, with such a good agreement with the experiment. Uh, in the next step, mm, then we looked, uh, we dug even deeper, we looked at uh, even more mutations, However, in this case, we looked at those mutations that are further from the uh, actual uh, uh, binding site of the ligand. So this would be a, a particularly challenging because these mutations, when they occur and uh, and uh, make a, a, a make a, a have an effect on the ligand binding, they actually do not directly interact with the ligand. So they make some indirect changes in the protein structure or maybe it's a dynamic allosteric network. So first of all, uh, it, now we, for, for these uh, mutations, we did not have data to compare uh, directly against delta delta Gs with the experimentally measured delta delta Gs. It, 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 it's not available usually. Uh, what clinicians, clinicians report usually is that, uh, are the restriction factors mm, that uh, uh, are mm, some that are only related to the delta delta Gs, but we were able to uh, have uh, to establish a connection between the, the delta delta Gs and the restriction factors, and uh, we built a very re reliable classifier of those that are susceptible. So in the upper right uh, quadrant, those would be uh, mm, correctly identified resistant mutations, uh, resistance inducing mutations, while those in the lower left. Uh, quadrant would be correctly identified uh, susceptible mutations, so those that actually even increase the binding affinity uh, or uh, in, in this case restriction factor uh, would be lowered for those uh, uh, mutations to a given drug. So we have a very good qu uh, uh, classifier just uh, which we extracted from the delta delta G values. Uh, and these were uh, previously known uh, known um, mutations with the in affecting known ligands but we also looked at uh, new mutations uh, so in particular uh, L76B that I have marked here uh, this mutation uh, is also known to uh, either induce uh, resistance or susceptibility and uh, uh, our collaborators have acquired uh, a number of new genotypes that uh, this mutation uh, acts uh, acts uh, on or rather appears in, and we were also uh, almost uh, in almost all cases, just except of uh, two outliers, we were able to correctly classify those effects. Uh, and once we were able to classify those effects, we could also uh, identify the underlying cause why this uh, uh, resistance or sus susceptibility occurs uh, upon this mutation. And a particularly interesting thing is that. Uh, once mutated away, this uh, leucine 76 allows uh, mm, allows uh, lysine, 
and uh, aspartate amino acids just uh, to form a hydrogen bond which changes the overall allosteric network and it changes then the interactions of a particular ligand binding to the active site. So this mutation indirectly, indirectly without uh, acting directly on, on the ligand, it indirectly changes the binding affinity and in turn the restriction factors and uh, in induces the uh, resistance or susceptibility to certain to, to other ligands. Uh, not only can we do this for the HIV uh, protease, of course, uh, we, uh, m uh, my colleague uh, Matteo Aldeghi, he looked into uh, a large number of, uh, mm, of uh, mm, proteins that are <coughs> binding various ligands that you can see uh, in this uh, figure. So in total 17 systems with 27 different ligands bound and he looked uh, at more than 100 mutations in those, uh, in all of those proteins, to 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 check how accurately can these mm, uh, drug uh, resistant mutations be be predicted, and in this case again we uh, we see that the uh, consensus uh, approach between uh, Amber 14 force field and Charm 22 star gives uh, an agreement with the experiment, which is lower, uh, it's which reaches uh, about one 1.2 kilocalories per mole of difference from the experimental, uh, experimentally measured uh, free energy differences. So this would be uh, 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 it for the uh, free energies, uh, for, for the amino acid mutations. Uh, I also, I have one more uh, application that I, I would like to talk about. Uh, it, uh, it is amino acid mutations in the protein-protein binding process. However, uh, for this particular uh, topic, I will uh, I would like to go into a bit more detail in the short talk uh, that is scheduled for the afternoon. And currently, I would like to already switch to the uh, DNA nucleic acid mutations. So, uh, to uh, in this case, we will be mutating DNA and looking at the, the thermodynamic cycles, uh, like as visualized here. I will come back to this in a, in a few minutes. Uh, now, uh, the um, the uh, underlying mechanism how we will be doing this is very similar so we will again be using PMX uh, just in this case uh, as uh, previously we used amino acids uh, uh, to, to create hybrid structures and topologies here we'll be using nuclear nucleic acids nucleotides to, to make a hybrid nucleotide uh, structure and topology in this case uh, so all the technical details are identical to the amino acids except uh, that uh, the uh, library is also smaller and it contains different uh, elements there right also we have uh, a web server which uh, can do uh, the the whole process automatically uh, let's have a look at the application of protein DNA of, of these alchemical calculations and protein DNA binding. So the thermodynamic cycle is uh, as follows. Uh, we are interested in mutating uh, I mean, uh, a, nucle in a nucleotide in a DNA which is in its unbound form. So uh, in, and in comparison, we, as a reference, we will use a, a uh, so, so uh, I'm sorry, this will be our reference. Uh, uh, free energy delta G1 and delta G4 will be our mm, uh, DNA, our uh, our DNA mutation of a molecule bound to the protein, and in total this will give us a relative free energy difference of uh, DNA binding to the protein uh, upon a nucleotide mutation. Uh, to probe how accurately we can uh, calculate these uh, free energy differences, we looked at a very large number, so uh, almost 400 mutations uh, in 16 different protein DNA complexes. These complexes comprise uh, transcription factors and uh, uh, nucleases. Uh, you, can, you can see in more detail here uh, if you're interested. But, uh, uh, right, so they are very, very diverse systems, right? And we, co if we pull all the all of the data together, so from all of these systems, we can see plot them uh, experimental versus calculated uh, free energy differences. We can see uh, that we get accuracies that are uh, between uh, that at most uh, accurate accurate predictions would reach uh, in total average would reach five 
and a half kilojoules per mole error from the experiment. And this is slightly worse than uh, the uh, de desired one kilocalories or four kilojoules per mole error uh, that we saw for the amino acid mutations. However, of course, uh, in this case, uh, there are uh, uh, there are several um, several uh, things to note here. For example, that the experimental values, if we look at the plot on the left, uh, they seem as if they are, have a very strict capping region. So uh, this indicates that my, it's likely that experimental measurements themselves they have a certain range where they could measure the the changes in the affinity. However, uh, of course, calculation does not does not uh, have any uh, limitation in that respect. So maybe it is also uh, uh, both inaccuracies in the experiment uh, or a limitation of the measurement range from the experimental side and also inaccuracies that uh, we have from our calculations that uh, contribute to this slightly larger error. And again, we uh, probed AMBER, CHARM and the consensus force field and we see that uh, if we have a consensus approach we are outperforming any individual force field uh, as taken separately. Uh, now, where, where where could we apply such a calculation of uh, delta delta G uh, for protein DNA binding? Well, we could uh, construct something uh, what is called um, a, a DNA profile, DNA binding profile. So uh, this is a, a profile that is acquired uh, from an experimental uh, measurement, and it shows uh, what frequency uh, of a uh, a nucleotide you would find at a given DNA position. So, uh, what what a nucleotide would be preferred there? We could also recalculate such profiles from our calculated delta delta G values, and once we do that, we obtain well a similar profiles. And now it's interesting to note that the top profile, the one on the uh, in the top panel, is uh, obtained from our calculations. However, uh, the l uh, four lower profiles are obtained from uh, different experimental techniques, and we can see that uh, it is, uh, and we can even quantify. I'm, I'm not going into the details here, but uh, our computational profile is uh, uh, mm, very much indistinguishable uh, from the uh, from the different computational techniques. So uh, it could be mm, considered to be to fall well within the uh, experimental error of identification of these profiles. Uh, and uh, all right, with this we can uh, proceed with the, to our third part, to the ligand modifications, ligand free energy calculations. And here, uh, here we will be looking at, at uh, a slightly, uh, yeah, different, uh, different approach because uh, mm -hmm. the same strategy will not work anymore. Uh, so pre-building a library for canonical amino acids or uh, nucleotide mutations will not work because uh, ligand modifications can be uh, very. Uh, um, a, a set of them can be very diverse, and every ligand pair that we would consider would uh, well would be unique, uh, since the chemical space is um, nearly infinite. So what we do, uh, we apply a different strategy. Here we uh, build three different modules uh, that would apply that would allow uh, dealing with any arbitrary modification. For that, we would. Firstly, need to identify atoms that would need to be morphed between the two uh, considered ligands. Uh, to do that, we can either align the um, two molecules. If they are similar, then the mapping will be quite good. However, if they are not similar in, st in, in their own um, 3D structure, we <coughs> rely on the maximum common substructures on a graph-based um, comparison of the two molecules. Uh, this is all uh, encoded in, in a rather complex uh, workflow, uh, but uh, the user doesn't need to worry about this. Uh, it, simply, the algorithm will be probing one path, will be probing another path, and will be choosing a more suitable solution. For example, if we were to align these two molecules, we could uh, identify either on the left maximum common substructure, which would be one uh, solution, the alignment would yield a different solution, and then uh, the algorithm would be intelligent enough to choose the better one according to its measures. Uh, subsequently, we, uh, the, we have a, an automated technique to build hybrid structures and topologies, and we also have a suggestions uh, for uh, ligand pairs in a small uh, network of uh, 
compounds. For example, if we have a, a network of compounds, if we have a compound library that uh, looks like this here, visualized, we would like to know which ligand would we like to mutate into which so that we uh, cover all this chemical library. So we build a pairwise matrix so uh, based on the distances that our algorithm calculates uh, intrinsically and uh, devises a distance matrix. Subsequently, this distance matrix can be uh, can be uh, uh, can be uh, built into a, a can be transformed into a minimum spanning tree or several minimum several sp sp several trees so that we would have redundancies in the in the library. Uh, now let's look how we could apply this uh, in, in this approach. So we have uh, scanned uh, a very large set of library uh, a very large set of uh, ligand modifications uh, for uh, ligands binding to a protein. Uh, so in in a sense we were acquiring delta delta G's uh, uh, in the following thermodynamic cycles uh, where uh, we looked at the ligand modification in water and also in the ligand in the same ligand modification when the pro mm, ligand is bound to the protein. So that's giving us the free energy difference of uh, ligand modification uh, uh, of, of ligand binding to the protein upon the that modification. Uh, now we scanned 11 systems and probed almost 500 ligand modifications and here is the overall summary of the results. Uh, there is a, a, a comparison of different force fields, GAF, CGNFF and our consensus and on the uh, and on the left here we see also the FEP plus which is a different uh, approach from a commercial software uh, a company, uh, Schrodinger uh, com company, which is uh, frequently used um, in the pharmaceutical uh, in, the, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, if we look now at the accuracies in terms, for example, let's look at the average and signed error. The top panel there, we see that a uh, uh, consensus approach performs either as well or even outperforms the best uh, results of the FEP plus. Uh, and in the mm, person correlation, we are also well within the error bars uh, uh, of, of the commer best commercial software. And again, consensus approach performs better than any single force field taken se considered separately. Uh, now, uh, the, the performance of uh, uh, calculations strongly uh, depends on the system that is being that is being explored. Uh, here I mm, have now broken down uh, all these results by system uh, on the uh, x-axis there is a, in, in each of these uh, plots it's the experimental value and on the y-axis is the calculated delta delta g value we can see that the more red dots there are the, uh, the, the worse the uh, prediction the worse the calculation accuracy is and we can see that some uh, systems really perform really well very very uh, the clouds look very blue there so we have high accuracy but uh, but it uh, strongly depends strongly depends on the system now we uh, uh, for for the last uh, three minutes of my talk I would like to uh, also tell about the absolute free energy calculations because not only can we do uh, the relative free energy calculations we can also look at the mm, at uh, disappearing or appearing the ligand full ligand in this case we would not get, uh, get a delta delta g but we would really aim to uh, compute the absolute delta g value uh, this would however uh, require a slightly different protocol we would require restraints so the ligand when it's decoupled there on the right side it would need to be restrained somehow to the protein and this those restraints would need to be uh, taken into account uh, in the free energy estimation uh, in the perturbations are of course larger in this case and uh, hence the convergence will be slower uh, the the protocol here uh, uh, is uh, uh, can be visualized also as the as this thermodynamic cycle we want to disappear the ligand uh, so decouple it from solvent on the left side, uh, apply the restraints and recouple it uh, in the uh, when it's bound to the protein, and also remove the restraints. So the cycle is slightly more complex than those cycles that I was showing before. Now, 
uh, as a test how our, how well our approaches work. Uh, we can use a, a test system which uh, has been recorded, mm, which has been collected by Aldegi uh, uh, and, uh, and the colleagues. So uh, in 2017, uh, so several years ago, Matteo collected uh, a set of 22 uh, Bromo domain proteins. And those are uh, uh, proteins that uh, interact uh, strongly with the bromosporin, which is a, a ligand inhibiting those uh, bromo domains. And uh, uh, he, uh, there is also experimental data available on, on the absolute binding free energies of uh, uh, bromosporin to all of these uh, bromo domains. And uh, what Matteo did then in, in 2017, he uh, calculated, he used the uh, Hamiltonian replica exchange enhanced free energy uh, uh, perturbation technique, so equilibrium technique, and obtained uh, the uh, results that are visualized in the upper left panel. Now we wanted to see what would happen if we were to apply uh, either not apply this enhanced uh, replica exchange protocol, just simple FEP. We see the, this in the middle panel, uh, in the uh, upper row, middle panel, we see that the accuracy drops. So from uh, 1.5 uh, in the average unsigned error, we drop to 2.3 average unsigned error. That's quite a large drop in kilocalories per mole. And um, uh, what if we apply the non-equilibrium uh, free energy protocol? Well, we gain uh, in accuracy, uh, and uh, accuracy becomes almost identical to that, uh, which is uh, achieved by Hamiltonian replica exchange FEP approach. Um, in uh, in terms of Pearson correlation, we actually with the non-equilibrium approach can reach the highest accuracy of these uh, of these three methods, almost reaching 0 0.6 uh, in Pearson correlation. Um, the uh, uh, we can also look at the breakdown uh, by system, but uh, of of each of these energy estimations. But maybe it's more interesting to look at the convergence. So we uh, here on the in the panel C, I'm showing the convergence, mm, or rather average unsigned error, of all of these calculations, uh, in uh, with the uh, 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 depending on the sampling time used per obtaining a single delta G value, and we see that uh, the uh, non-equilibrium free energy um, protocol converges very quickly to its uh, final. Uh, accuracy, while the non-enhanced free energy uh, perturbation protocol um, uh, takes takes quite some time, and uh, even uh, even uh, after the 650 nanoseconds invested per single delta G calculation, it still has not converged to the enhanced uh, um, sampling uh, technique result. All right, so with this, I think I I'm. Uh, finished and uh, just to summarize what we looked at today was uh, uh, f alchemical free energy calculations uh, of amino acid mutations, nucleotide mutations and ligand modifications as well as uh, a little glimpse at the uh, absolute uh, li ligand uh, free energy calculations yeah thank you my acknowledgement slides and thank you